Let's pray. God, we are so indebted to you for doing what we could never do for ourselves, for securing eternity in your presence when we deserve to be separated from everything good in you, destined only for hell, only for destruction. We had walked our own way. We had sought the broad path And you brought us to a narrow road through the death of your son, a road leading to life and joy, fellowship with you, infinite delight in your presence. God, we pray this morning to have our hearts riveted by eternal realities, to lift our gaze from the things under the sun. think of you. God, we need your help this morning. We thank you that you have spoken, that you have conveyed your thoughts. And we ask this morning to have soft hearts and open ears to your word. Would you be pleased to do your work in us? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Does it ever seem like nice guys finish last? Billy Joel seemed to think so. He wrote, only the good die young. They say there's a heaven for those who await. Some say it's better, but I say it ain't. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. You know that only the good die young. I don't know if you've ever felt that those words sort of ring true in our under-the-sun experience. The life on this earth is filled with inequities, things that are not as they should be, injustices, unfairness. The guilty go free, the innocent get punished, liars win and cheaters prosper, the godly go without. I want to read this morning from God's Word. The passage we'll be studying together, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, beginning in verse 10 to the end of the chapter. We're going to look this morning at biblical wisdom and its response to the inequities of life. Here's what Solomon writes. So then, I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, And they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This, too, is futility. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear Him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. There is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. So I commended pleasure. For there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry. And this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, He will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. What we have in this passage are two under-the-sun observations about the inequities of life and then heavenly wisdom responding to those observations. 
two under the sun observations about the inequities of life and Solomon's response with heavenly wisdom. The first observation Solomon makes is simply this, sinners get away with it. Sinners get away with it. This is Solomon's first under the sun explanation and it comes in two parts. The first deals with religious hypocrites. Look what Solomon writes about in verse 10. So then, I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This is futility. This is where the mafia goes to church. Notice what Solomon says here, I have seen. I have seen. This is his observation, his what's going on in the world around me. I can see it with my own eyes. And what does he see? The wicked are buried. The wicked are buried. That is, they are honored in their death. They are given the regalia and the pomp and the circumstance that go with an honorable funeral. And who are these wicked? Solomon describes them as the ones who used to go in and out from the holy place. These are religious hypocrites. Their wickedness was well known. It was visible to everybody. Everybody knew that these were wicked men. And their church going or their temple going was also highly visible. They had free access to God's place. They went in and out from the holy place and these were not holy men. Solomon says this is a futility. Notice he describes that they are forgotten in the city where they did this. And there's some debate about the original Hebrew text here. Uh, should the word be forgotten or should the word be praised? Some Hebrew manuscripts uh, say they are, they are praised in the city where they did this. Uh, the NIV uses the word praised. The idea is that their hypocrisy is honored. If the idea is that they are forgotten, then their hypocrisy is forgotten at their burial. Either way, these people receive honor and praise at their funeral. These are the people at whose funeral is told all manner of lies. Oh, he loved his family. He was such a good guy. Everyone loved him. He's in a better place now. You know, heaven is better off now that he's there. Maybe you've heard these things said. But everyone knows how he cheated his business partners. He was unfaithful to his wife. He neglected his kids. He bullied everyone who crossed him. He lied whenever it suited him. He flattered others to get his way. He hoarded his money and anyone else's money he could get a hold of. But here at his burial, he is eulogized, honored, praised, whitewashed. And you know, there's something about the finality and the seriousness of death that changes our perspectives, causes us to sort of rewrite someone's history. You know, why do we do this? <laughs> why do we make up stories? Why do we remember only the faint glimmers of maybe some good things at a really bad guy's funeral? Maybe this takes away the sting of death for us. Maybe this helps us to feel better about ourselves. You know, if that really rotten guy can be eulogized at his funeral, then there's hope for me too. If we can all pat ourselves on the back and say, he's in a better place, then maybe I can go on living the way I want to live. To remove any notion that there might be accountability for my own wrongdoing. So we imagine the man in the coffin to be someone completely different than the wicked man who went in and out of the holy place. Well, Solomon is under no such illusion. He says this is a futility. Hevel. This is frustrating. There's another kind of sinner who gets away with it, not just the religious hypocrites in verse 10, but in verse 11, someone we might call a mercy pirate. That is someone who is hijacking the mercy of God, using the patience of God as an opportunity for the pursuit of sin, sailing through life on stolen time and borrowed breaths, 
living as if there were no consequences to their godless existence. Look at verse 11. Solomon says, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. What we see here is a delay of justice. You've heard the principle, when the cat is away, the mice will play. And you know this principle, you parents, right? When you don't discipline your children quickly or consistently for some infraction, what do your kids do with that leniency? Oh, my parents were so merciful. I didn't get what I deserved. I am going to straighten up my act. (laughs) Uh, No. Hey, no consequences for that one? Maybe I could try this one too. We know that evil lurks in us. It's just easier to see in our children, perhaps. You teachers know this in the classroom. You let a little bit slide, and more is coming. We know this in the realm of human governance, right? When the Sentence for a crime takes a long time to come around. The wheels of justice grind slowly. There can be incentive for people to commit more crimes. When no justice is given, when no punishment is enforced, the crime rates go up. We know this with our local law enforcement, right? We do what we can get away with. Maybe if you've ever met a local law enforcement officer, you may have asked him or her the question, how much over the posted speed limit can I drive without getting pulled over? Right? We want to know not what is the law, but what can I get away with? What gets enforced? That's where the new law is. This principle has universal application for us. But Solomon is concerned with something much more problematic than our attitude towards various authority structures in life. His statement is an indictment of humanity's persistent rebellion during the delay of God's justice. God has not yet taken his vengeance on the religious hypocrites or the hijackers of his mercy, those who use his gifts and they mistake mercy for leniency. I broke a rule. Nothing seemed to come of it. I guess I can break the rules with impunity. The rules must be there just to keep me from having any fun. Throw off the yoke. Let's do whatever we want. That is not what God's mercy is there for. Listen to Romans 2. Paul writes, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and his tolerance and his patience? Not realizing that God's Kindness leads you toward repentance. What is the goal of God's kindness, his patience? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, Romans 2.5, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of the wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You see, God is presently patient, presently forbearing, tolerant, Kind. He's not giving humanity what humanity deserves. And Jonathan Edwards, describing this verse, talked about the mercy of God like a, a great dam holding back a mighty body of water. And every time a human sins, it's like he is throwing more cupfuls, more bucketfuls, more oceanfuls of water behind the dam. And that dam will not always hold. There is a day coming when God's patience will run out. That patience which gave opportunity for men to repent. When his righteous judgment, that is his good and right and just judgment, will be revealed. 2 Peter chapter 3 says something similar. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of God's coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, 
it escapes their notice, but that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The purpose of God's slowness is to give humanity opportunity to repent and to be saved. And what do we do? We turn that kindness, that patience, that slowness into license. Free reign. Do whatever we want. And listen to Solomon's assessment here in verse 11. The hearts of the sons of men are given fully to do evil. He gets at the reality of our problem as a race. The problem is at the heart level. All of our outward acts flow from who we are on the inside. And Solomon reminds us who we are, in case we had forgotten. Literally, he calls us the sons of Ha-Adam, the sons of the Adam, sons of the man. We are descendants of that first rebel, that first transgressor. He reminds us of our identity, naturally speaking. And you know, rules and regulations go only so far to stem the tide of that human rebellion. What a person needs is a fundamental transformation at the heart level. And only then do we begin to ask questions not like, what can I get away with? But what would be pleasing to my God? Rebellious humanity wants to know what's allowed, what is permissible. But a regenerate heart says, what would be pleasing to my God? This futility, this difficulty was hard for Solomon to swallow rampant wickedness and people not getting what they deserved, God's kindness being turned into license. And yet he gives us a very wise response in verses 12 and 13. How should you and I respond to the inequities of life when wicked men live long and the godly don't seem to be blessed? His response is fear God. Look at verse 12. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. This is wisdom's response to the inequities of life. You look around you and you say, life isn't fair. I put in my dues. I've done what God expected of me. Why is my life not blessed like those people around me? And Solomon's response, fear God. And I want you to notice something first in verse 12. Solomon says, I know. Right there in the middle of the verse. I know. This is important. This is different than what Solomon has said in the past. Despite what it seems like under the sun, Solomon knows something. Contrary to what can be observed, back in chapter 7, verse 15, he said, I have seen. In 8, verse 9, he said, I have seen. And in 8, verse 10, he said, I have seen. But here Solomon says, I know. There's a change here. This is the response of faith and faith in what is true. And it is a truth that is not readily apparent if our gaze is constantly fixed under the sun along the horizon, on earthly appearances. And what is this truth that Solomon has confidence in, despite what he has seen under the sun? That it goes well for those who fear God. And it will not go well for those who do not fear God. 
Listen to the way he describes the wicked in verse 12. The sinner who does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life. And in verse 13, it will not be well for the evil man and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. Think for a moment about the guy who gets away with murder. That's not right. Imagine if someone you knew and loved were the victim. How would you feel about that man who got away with murder? And if he did it a hundred times and got to live free? How come he never gets caught? Why doesn't he ever get his due? He lengthens his days. He just goes on with life unpunished. Where is the justice? But in verse 13, Solomon says, it will not go well with him, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow. Well, which is it, Solomon? Does he live a long time or does he not? Does the wicked man lengthen his days or does he not? There's a really striking word picture here. The two ideas of the, the wicked man lengthening his days and not lengthening his days juxtaposed is provocative. What is going on here? It, does he live a long time or does he not? And these two ways of saying it are, are said slightly different. The word picture of a lengthening his days like a shadow is important. Think about your shadow. If you went outside right now, uh, your shadow would be smaller than you are. At 1 p.m., what would your shadow look like? At, at 3 p.m., what would your shadow look like? At 4 p.m., what would your shadow look like? But at 5.52 p.m. this evening, your shadow wouldn't be half your height or equal to your height or twice your height or 20 times your height. Your shadow would stretch to the horizon as though it would never end. That's the picture here. As the sun sets on the godless man, his days are not lengthened as your shadow is at sunset. He may have lived long on the earth, but in view of the endless swath of eternity, the wicked man's brief stay on God's earth is a forgettable blip. Do you have an eternal perspective? Have you done the math? on how long this life is compared to eternity. If you could somehow measure your life with a 12-inch ruler and compare that with 10,000 12-inch rulers and multiply that times another 10,000 and make up some other number, 16 trillion. Add more rulers, double it, multiply it by a jillion. There really is no comparison between a life in eternity and a life on this earth, just a vapor. You and I have often heard the complaint, maybe even voiced the complaint, how could God allow such evil to persist in this world? Skeptics even charge God with crime or charge God with non-existence. Evil exists, therefore God can't. It's a silly syllogism. The answer to the question, which is a good question, how can God allow such evil to persist? The answer to the question is, well, he can't and he won't. We're just looking at a snapshot of a brief portion of time. God will have his day. But right now, he is patient. Oh, God is so patient. But time will run out on the mercy pirates and the religious hypocrites. If I could fast forward to the final scene of our present era of human history, Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus comes back to the earth to vindicate his own name, to set up his kingdom, John, the revelator, writes this. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. 
And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, the small and the great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed, killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Will it be well for the evil man in the day of God's vindication? When you and I have the long view, when we know how the story ends, we agree with Solomon and we know this. It will not go well with those who do not fear God. It will go very, very terribly. Verse 12 says, It will be well, however, for those who fear God, who fear Him openly. And there Solomon enjoins us to fear God rather than men, to fear God publicly, openly. Those who are not afraid to fear God, those who take God seriously, it will go well with us. That is wisdom's response to the first set of iniquities that Solomon observed He makes another observation beginning in verse 14. That is that sinners seem to get all the breaks. Look what Solomon says. There is a futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. Solomon has now lowered his gaze under the sun and is observing the situations that go on around him and he sees the inequities, the unfairness, that the results are not in keeping with the actions. People who do what's right don't seem to be rewarded for doing what's right and people who do what's wrong seem to be rewarded according to doing what is right. It's all backwards and Solomon says these are not as they should be. He calls it a futility which is done On the earth, life's not fair. The good guys don't win. The bad guys get all the breaks. This is contrary to the way it seems like it should be. In fact, you remember Job's friends came to him with this very set of arguments. They said, Job, things aren't going well for you. You must have sinned. There must be some secret upheaval in your life, some secret crime that you're not confessing because things aren't going well. We all know that if you wake up in the morning and have your daily quiet time, that things are going to go well for you, Job. We know that if you give to the poor, that God's going to bless you. What they did not account for was the very thing Solomon is preaching. The curse of God on the earth because of fallen man. Things aren't as they should be. 
Things don't always follow the prescription and the pattern, the principles of life. I think about godly men like John Rogers, John Hooper, Rowland Taylor and Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, pastors and fathers and husbands who were desirous to lead their people to faithfully speak the truth. And they were pulled out of their homes, they were pulled out of their churches and marched before their families. Their books were burned in the public square. And as they said goodbye to wives and infant children, on their way to a pile of wood where they would be burned by Queen Mary I, Queen of England, 1553 to 1558. 288 Protestants she had burned because they held on to the truth of God's word and the purity of the gospel. Why does she get to be queen? And why do the good guys lose? Maybe you've experienced this feeling in your own life. Your pursuit of godliness does not result in the blessed life you had hoped for, while others who aren't living life God's way seem to prosper. We need to be very careful that we do not fall into some sort of Christian karma idea. A mechanistic view of godliness that I put in my godliness and out comes the blessing. I fulfill my requirements, I check off the boxes, I keep my religious duty, I do what's right, and I expect to be blessed. It might have the veneer of godliness, but it is merely idolatry, right? That is the love of the blessing rather than the love of God, the giver of all good things. Rather than a desire to live for his glory and to do what's right and do what pleases him, no matter the cost, no matter the consequences. And you and I feel that temptation to fix the blessings that I've missed, that everybody else seems to be getting, if I'll just read my Bible more, if I'll just do Christian duty more, neglecting God altogether and doing the duty for the sake of getting a blessing. That's pagan religion. This is what Paul warned about in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He talked about ungodly men who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. The idea that if I just check off the boxes of godliness, I can get blessing. We treat God like a genie in a bottle. I rub the lamp the right way three times and... Out comes the genie to give my wishes. It's tough when life doesn't seem fair. But there is a biblical response, a heavenly wisdom response. Solomon gives that to us in verses 15 to 17. It is simply this, trust God. When life doesn't seem fair, When things aren't working out the way you think they should based on what you're doing, trust God. And there are really two expressions of this trust in God. The first one is in verse 15, and it's surprising. We might summarize it this way. Have fun. Enjoy life. Take pleasure in what God gives. Notice what Solomon says in verse 15. So I commended pleasure. For there's nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry. For this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. Really remarkable message from Solomon at this point. And yet it is such a counterintuitive cure to the doldrums of feeling like life isn't fair. Take a look at what you have. Open your pantry, find something good to eat, and enjoy it. (laughs) Open your garage, find something fun to drive, and enjoy it at the speed limit. 
Look in your living room at the kids sprouting up all around you and wrestle them to the ground. Enjoy them. Eat and drink and be merry. Have fun. Take pleasure. Remarkable statements. Notice the key here in verse 15. These are the days of life which God has given him under the sun. The key is understanding what these joys are. They are good gifts from a good God to be enjoyed. This is what Paul tells the rich in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Tell the rich that God gives us all things to enjoy. It's not wrong to have things. Enjoy them. It's not wrong to have a great meal. Enjoy it. And when you do this correctly, it's actually the cure for an envy and discontentment with an unfair life. This is different than the messages that uh, Solomon gave before. When you think back to Ecclesiastes 2.24, you can turn back there. This is a similar sounding statement with a very important difference. Ecclesiastes 2.24 reads this. There is no good in a man that he could eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. What's important there is man does not have the capacity in himself to get joy out of life under the sun. In that part of Ecclesiastes, Solomon was lamenting his failed experiment of trying to squeeze enjoyment out of life apart from God. But he doesn't leave us there as if to say there's no enjoyment to be had. But the point of this book is you orient yourself around the giver of all good things and you will find that his gifts that he gives are enjoyable. This enjoyment is what comes from the good hand of God. What a great command. Enjoy what God gives. This is a command for contentment. Don't enjoy what God gave to somebody else that you wish you had. That's not where the enjoyment is found. The enjoyment is found in the things that God gives. God's good gifts are to be enjoyed. They are reflections of his kindness and love and grace and goodness. And I want you to understand the difference between idolatry and the worship of God as it relates to the enjoyment of good gifts. The worshiper enjoys the gift and loves the giver. And it produces joy. The idolater loves the gift, forgets the giver, and it results in futility. The worshiper of God is thankful because he is undeserving. And he knows it. He is eager to receive what God graciously gives. And he's also ready to let it go according to God's perfect plan. The idolater is complaining, entitled, comparing himself with others, and has a heart filled with unsatisfiable desires. The worshiper of God is able to rejoice when others are blessed. The idolater is jealous of others, ungrateful, bitter. So Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, Men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Contentment. You see, a so-called godliness can mask idolatry if the point is, I want blessing. But godliness with contentment produces great gain. Solomon's heavenly wisdom here is brilliant. <laughs> the right response to the inequities of life is to gratefully receive and enjoy the good things that God has given you. And notice verse 15. This kind of joy stands by him in his toils. That's a great message. 
This isn't a, a kind of joy that comes and goes with the waves of happenstance. This kind of joy transcends circumstance because it is rooted in God himself. There's a second expression of trust in God revealed in verses 16 and 17. Solomon says, when I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. What is the expression of trust here? It's a resignation to trust God when we don't have all the information. To trust God when he withholds information. Specifically, information about how he chooses to run the world. Right? Job didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. He worshipped. He trusted. He wrestled. He struggled. He trusted. He worshipped. Wisdom comes in knowing what it is we don't know and can't know. This kind of coming to the end of yourself, coming to the end of your intellectual abilities is good. God's withholding of the inner workings of his providence and the way he is dealing with human history humbles the pride of man. It makes us aware of our need of God and our need to be rescued. This is a great place to be. When you look around you and life seems unfair, when it doesn't seem right, when it seems unjust, you notice the inequities around you. Trust God. He knows what he's doing. You and I don't know what he's doing, but he knows what he is doing. I want to go back to a verse as we close this morning. Verse 14, Solomon says, The futility which is done on the earth that a righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. If we think theologically for a moment, and we ask ourselves, who are the righteous and what deeds have they done? And Who are the wicked and what deeds have they done? And why don't people get what they deserve? The reality is, according to Romans chapter 3 and so many other places in Scripture, there is no one who does good, not even one. There is no one righteous. There is no one who fears God. If you and I are tempted to think that I'm not getting what I deserve, we misunderstand ourselves. In human history, there's only been one person who has been righteous and to whom it happened according to the deeds of the wicked. And there has only been a world of wicked people to whom God has been kind and patient, and tolerant. Jesus, the righteous, God's only son, his beloved son, who never sinned, couldn't sin, never erred, never strayed, never transgressed God's laws, always honored God, always loved his father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, always loved his neighbors, always fulfilled every jot and tittle of what God required. And yet Jesus was counted among transgressors, taken away with the wicked, put on trial with trumped up charges, tortured and executed. Truly in the ultimate sense, he is the only one who is righteous to whom it has happened according to the deeds of the wicked. When he took upon himself the sins of everyone who would ever believe, 
The sins in the past, sins in the present, sins in the future, every sin. And took them, took them upon himself to be treated as if he had sinned every sin I would sin. To be condemned. To be judged. To bear the full weight of the wrath of Almighty God. So that it could happen according to the wicked, what is due the righteous. Right? Romans chapter 4, verse 5. To the one who does not work but believes him who declares righteous the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So that God is willing to treat anyone who would believe in his son as if they had only ever done everything right and as if they had never done anything wrong. This is our only hope. This is what lifts our gaze beyond the horizon of this world only. To know that we have been rescued from this dominion of darkness and made citizens of his heavenly kingdom. That heaven is our home where unrighteousness is not allowed, but where everything is right and good and beautiful and perfect. Friends, that is our home. That is where we belong. We don't expect that here, but we are in need regularly of a heavenly perspective. Let's pray. God, we give you praise for these words from Solomon, for this wisdom to help us with the troubling realities we see around us. Things are not as they should be. And yet the day is coming, the day we long for, when you are vindicated, when everything is set right, when your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will return. He is our king. He is our treasure. God, in the meantime, make us thankful, grateful for any blessings that you see fit to give us. May we rejoice in them and delight in them as gifts from you. Keep us from loving the gift over the giver and make us ambassadors of another realm, of another time that you might be kind to draw many to yourself through us, and we ask it in Jesus' name.